Okay, so today we're going to be talking about Chapter 3, which is cell structure and function of primarily our bacterial cells, which again, remember we have two different main types of cells. We have our eukaryotic cells and our prokaryotic cells. So let's start off first with our processes of life that all living organisms have to maintain in general. So if anything is a living organism, it is going to have to go through these four processes of life. And I am currently on page 59 of your textbook. And I'm just going to go ahead and go through, and I'll do this a little differently today. I don't have access to my whiteboard. And um, let me know if this works better for you or how you prefer doing uh, your online learning for your lectures. Because unfortunately, this is probably the best way we have to do at the moment. And um, this is just how it's going to be. So um, we have our process of life. There are four. The first one is growth. Um, all living organisms can grow. They have to be able to grow and increase in size and stature. And that might be um, they're growing, such as a bacteria cell, excuse me, increases its numbers of um, DNA, I shouldn't say increases the number of DNA, but increases ribosomes, increases material inside of the cell until it's ready to replicate. So we have that. Um, the second one is reproduction. A living organism, in order to be considered a species, has to be able to reproduce. We learned that in chapter three, uh, excuse me, chapter four, where we're talking about organisms that are not considered a species um, because they cannot be have capabilities of reproducing. So um, organisms will normally have the ability to reproduce themselves. There are very rare instances, such as the mule or a liger that is not capable of reproducing even though that would be considered a living organism. Um, viruses are considered non-living. There's a number of reasons why, one of which is because they cannot reproduce themselves. They must um, hijack machinery of a living organism to be able to do that. So they have to go into a cell and be able to take that over and then be able to start manipulating the cell in order to reproduce. So reproduction, they need to be able to um, do so either asexually, sexually, by propagation, some form or fashion they have to be able to reproduce. Our third process of life, life is that they have to have some form of responsiveness. All living things respond to their environment. So um, even plants, plants will respond to sunlight by growing toward the sunlight. So that's still a response. A lot of times we think of response as moving. And it's not necessarily moving, but it's responding. It's causing an action based upon, or a reaction based upon the outside action that is going on. Um, the fourth, metabolism. This is our fourth process of life that must go on. It can be defined as the ability of an organism to take in nutrients from the outside themselves and use the nutrients in a series of controlled chemical reactions to provide energy and structures needed to grow, reproduce, and be responsive. So without metabolism, you can't grow, reproduce, and be responsive, um, which makes sense because if you don't consume food, you're eventually going to die. Um, so that is metabolism. That is your fourth process of life. All of these are very important when we look at these structures, uh, living organisms, I should say, not just these structures in general. Now, let's take a look at our two types of cells. We have what's called prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Those are our two main types of cells. Um, swan, there, there's theater swan, and Schleiden are the ones that are responsible for developing the cell theory and explaining just a lot of things that we understand now as um, what an organism has to be able to do at the cellular level. They are very important for that. Let's go ahead and take a look at some different cell types. Now, we have the cell type that we're comfortable with. And we've learned if we've already taken anatomy, which there might be a couple of you that have it, but most of you have. And you're going to go through all of these different cell structures here in a typical eukaryotic cell. 
This would be a typical animal cell that you're looking at here, which would be also for humans as well. So this is your typical animal cell. It's going to have a number of organelles and things of that nature in it. This will be your typical bacterial cell here. Much smaller, um, much, they do not have membrane bound organelles. They have simpler, like ribosomes, they'll have those. They'll have a region for the nucleus called the nucleoid. We're going to go through all these different things here in just a moment. But this is a much smaller cell as well than your typical animal cell. Animal cells are much, much larger than even your smallest, uh, excuse me, even your largest bacteria cell. So let's take a look at some of the differences. And similarities, I'm going to pull my book away because that was page 60 and 61. And then I'm going to put this here. And we'll talk about eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells. And I'm sure this is your favorite thing ever if you were in grade school and we did the Venn diagram to show similarities and differences. So first things first, I'm going to do the uh, similarities. They all have cell membranes. Okay, they're all going to have ribosomes. Now, um, yes, they do both have ribosomes. Hopefully you can see that okay. However, um, the ones for a prokaryotic cell are smaller than the ones for a eukaryotic cell. We'll just point that out right now. And then they're all gonna have DNA. Now, how they're stored, how it's um, housed, and things of that nature in the cell may be different, but they're both gonna have DNA. All right, so eukaryotic cells have membrane-bound organelles. So that's an example, mitochondria, I'm just gonna put mito. Um, and then the Golgi apparatus, I'll just put Golgi. That's just some examples of a couple of different organelles they can have. Another one they will have is a nucleus. This is a major thing that we classify eukaryotic cells by is that they have a nucleus where their DNA is housed. They don't have that in a prokaryotic cell. There's no nucleus, okay? They're much, much simpler. Eukaryotic cells are typically more complex. Prokaryotic cells are simple. Smaller, larger. Now those are our similarities versus our differences in these cells. Now we're gonna go ahead and go into the focus of this chapter, which is the prokaryotic cell. Now remember, eukaryotic means true nucleus. And prokaryotic means before nucleus. Pro means before. So that means they do not have a nucleus. And just go back to chapter four for our little reminders of these two cell types so we understand the difference between the two. Remember this is gonna be animals, plants, fungus, and also protist that are classified as a eukaryotic cell. Prokaryotic will be bacteria, and archaea. Those are our two main cell types for prokaryotic cells. Now let's go ahead and go into our cell structures. I think this is a lot of fun. And we'll start with external and then go to the internal. So what I do, let me just go ahead and explain this so it sounds simpler to you. 
um, is I focus on bacteria and then we compare uh, archaea to bacteria. So now you've already studied the cell whenever we look at, um, pro, um, bleh, let me erase that word, eukaryotic structures. You've studied the human body and if you've studied the human body, you have studied the animal cell. So with that being said, I don't talk a whole lot about the animal cell. I feel like that is something you can focus on in anatomy. Whereas micro, we're going to focus on the bacteria and then we're going to compare archaea to our bacterial cells. So we'll start out with our bacteria. And what cell type is bacteria? It's a prokaryotic cell. We'll remind ourselves of this. Okay. And we're going to start with our external features. And if you want to look along in the book, I'm going to move my, my tablet back and forth and we can pull the book out here and take a look at it. However, I am currently starting with page 62 and looking at the first external structure that I want to focus on, which is a glycocalyx, or plural, glycocalyces. Now, a glycocalyx, you had those in with your animal cells. You may not have realized it. Um, glycocalyx just means sugary coating. So, in a big fancy meaning that also may mean sweet cup, that's what your book has is referring it to, um, is a big fancy meaning for a bunch of glyco or sugars. Or as our books like to say, carbohydrates. Oops, I'm writing it in the wrong spot. Carbohydrates. Because that's what sugars are, right? That are going to cover the outside of the cell. So here's my cell going to cover the external structure of the cell and give it identifying markers so that one cell can identify with the other or it can help attach this cell to another, things of that nature. So they have some helpful things that they're going to do. There's a couple of different types of, of glycocalyces. When we're looking at bacteria, one of which is called a capsule and the other one is called a slime layer. A capsule is going to be tightly bound to the cell, whereas a slime layer is loosely bound. So there's your major differences between the two. And they're great with helping one cell attached to another so we can create a, a community of bacterial cells, for example. And a community of bacterial cells and a community of a number of different organisms. Let me even elaborate on that. Um, they may not just be the same type. Would be what we call a biofilm. And we're going to talk about biofilms in this chapter. Um, but they go ahead and start mentioning these biofilms. I don't know if you can see what I just did right there. Okay. But there's biofilms where we start talking about it in this third paragraph. Talking about um, glycocalyces, they also help cells from drying. Okay, so they're going to help them stick them together, also help them from drying out. Uh, the fancy term for drying out is desiccation. Hope you can see this okay. Let's zoom in here. Yeah, you can see all that. Um, play a role in the ability of pathogens to survive and to be able to cause disease. So pathogen, I saw some people talking about pathogens and saying they were viruses. Uh, a pathogen is a little bit more generalized. It's any um, thing that can cause disease. All right, that's what a pathogen is. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about pathogens when we get into that chapter a little bit more where we're talking about infections and diseases. Right now we're just talking about structures, things of that nature, so we're still just getting started. Um, slime layers, 
Um, like I said, the capsules are, are tightly bound um, all the way around, and then a slime layer is loosely bound. So some of these are going to help things stick together. Um, attaching to surfaces, they'll help with that. I'm trying to think of some other things it's going to help with. Um, a lot of bacteria cause de dental cavities or dental caries in a biofilm. That's an example of a biofilm is your plaque on your teeth. Another example of biofilm would be pond scum, um, things of that nature. They're all helping one cell to attach to another um, with the slime layers and be able to create those communities known as biofilms. Um, also works as um, recognition. Okay, so you can recognize, one cell can recognize another. That's what those um, slime layers and capsules can do. Let me go back and make sure we understand that. Because um, they can help identify one cell as, as self. Okay. Um, next external component I want to look at. Let me go ahead and move this book out of the way. And let me reiterate where these are good examples. Okay, pictures of your capsule right here. This is on page 62. And your slime layer, that's on page 63. Uh, excuse me, 62 as well. But it is B. This one's A, that one's B. Um, six, page 62, example A, figure 3.5, is your capsule. B is your slime layer. Uh, now let's go ahead and go to our next external structure. Sorry guys, I'm trying to do this with very limited space. In our next external structure, is going to be flagella. So we have our glycocalyces is the first one. Let me just put that one there, number one. Number two, flagella. Now flagella typically help with movement of your cell. We're gonna make this really easy. You'll notice on page 63, there's all this elaborate detail about the structure of a flagella in the cell wall and in the cell membrane, I really don't care about that. I want you to understand what a flagella does. It helps to allow movement for the cell. And it typically moves back and forth in a whip-like motion. I do not care about the filament, hook, basal body, or how it's attached. I'm not going to ask you those questions. What is a flagella? What does it do? Um, we do have some specialized flagella that literally, okay, so here's my cell. Here's my flagella that goes around it. So hopefully everybody could see that. Sorry, I don't have a different color pencil. And then we have a membrane that goes around that. Okay. So we have an endomembrane space that's between the two. Now, whenever this flagella starts to move, it's going to cause problems because now it's going to cause a whip-like motion and it's going to cause it to spin. So now, instead of having a regular rod shape, our cell will then have a spiral shape. Okay, this is where we get our spiral bacteria, uh, spiral shaped bacteria because the flagella is in a membrane okay so there's our endomembrane and on the inside between the cell membrane and the outer membrane that's the endomembrane is the flagellum and when it starts to spin or put back and forth it's going to cause a spiral shape we call these in general endoflagellates Okay, so the cell type is a um, spirillum or spirochete, things of that nature based upon the shape. However, in general, we call all of them endoflagellates because of the flagella that is inside of the endomembrane that is going to be on the outside. 
Um, let me see if I've got a picture of that, an explanation here close. I do not, so we will probably have to come back and talk about that a little bit more. Not sure why we don't just go ahead and talk about that there, but we don't. Because it's endoflagella. It's right here, but there's no pictures of it in your textbook. I'll see if I can find one, um, and I'll put it up on your assignment in this chapter. All right, so there's the different types of flagella. We have paratrichus. Paratrichus means basically we have flagella coming out everywhere. All these flagella, they're all over the place. This is on page 64. Um, single, single polar flagella. This one is coming out of one end. Or both ends. Um, this is going to be an endoflagellate that is going to be spirilla. And then there's a tuft of polar flagella. This one has a number of them coming out of one location. There's just a number of different ways that they can be arranged on their flagella. Um, and basically it's going to allow us to be able to move. And the movement, we're going to go ahead and talk about taxes. Okay. So it's going to allow for movement or allow for what we call taxes. Okay. Which is basically a response to a stimulus. Okay. So taxes, there's a number of different ones. We have what's called phototaxis. So the stimulus is photons. The response to it would be typically to move toward or away. So a lot of your photosynthetic bacteria, meaning bacteria that are going to um, use harness sunlight to be able to gain their food source, are going to perform phototaxis. So that would be an example of phototaxis. Um, another one would be chemotaxis. Chemo would be your stimulus. Um, so movement toward a chemical. I think a taxi, what do you use a taxi for? To transfer yourself from one place to another. So this is movement toward a chemical. Okay, um, aerotaxis. Movement toward air or away from it. It may be away depending upon what they're going to need um, specifically. I'm trying to think of another good taxis. Chemotaxis, phototaxis, aerotaxis. Can't think of another one right off the top of my head. Now another special thing they have, we're still on the external structures. Remember? is a specialized, I like to call it a specialized, um, shorter segment that is similar to flagella, but it's not. So we have what's called fimbriae. Um, stiff outer rod-like extensions. I'll call them rod-like. Okay, and they have, they're full of protein. And they're sticky. So they're going to help them stick to um, each other or to the environment. Now, we also have what's called pili. And I'm going to call this 3A. Because these are specialized, we're going to call them specialized fimbriae. 
that allow for bacterial conjugation. Now, we haven't really talked a lot about it, but um, we will be talking about how bacteria reproduce. They do not reproduce sexually. They reproduce asexually by a process known as binary fission. So basically, they're going to perform a form I like to call, it's not mitosis, but it's about as close as you're going to get to mitosis. So if you understand mitosis from your animal cell that you studied in anatomy, then you'll be able to understand basically what bacteria do in order to replicate. They just basically copy themselves. Now, um, how do we get a large number of bacteria that are resistant to certain um, certain types of antibiotics, medications, um, external environments, things of that nature? Well, here's this really cool thing that they can do. They can link up their pili. So here's my bacteria number one, and there's bacteria number two, and here's my my pili. Well, let's just say that they link them up and they exchange small pieces of DNA. Now, I didn't say the large one. They can't get all that through there, but they have little tiny pieces of DNA and these little tiny pieces of DNA are called plasmids. We're going to talk about those in a little bit, but they're called plasmids. And these plasmids are able to be exchanged via this portal, if you will, okay? So the pili will allow for that. So it's almost like walking down the street and you see someone that has really pretty eyes and you go, oh man, I love those eyes. Can I have that DNA for them? And you just shake hands and exchange it. It's almost that simple. So they're exchanging the genetic information. As long as it's small pieces, they are able to do that. So that's a really cool thing that bacteria can do. And that's about as close to sexual reproduction as a bacteria is going to get. So we've gone through that. Those are our external features. I am going to stop so that I can just go through cell walls and do just cell walls and you can get a good understanding of those. Um, because cell walls are pretty complex, I think they're a little confusing sometimes. So if we just sit down and just do cell walls at once, that way you can watch it over and over, and then we'll do the internal features. So we're on external features, we're going to do the cell wall, which is still considered an external feature, and then we'll get into the internal features um, throughout the rest of this chapter.